Recall Kepler's laws of planetary motion, specifically the second law. The second law is the unusual one, if you will. It's what's called the law of equal areas. I mention the law of equal areas to all of my classes. I give you a qualitative description of it, but I don't really say anything else beyond that. We now re-examine it here in AP Physics C. Okay, so Kepler's second law is the law of equal areas. And typically I always describe it in my classes in the following way. Empirically, by looking at Tycho's data, essentially what Kepler does is he teases out of that data these empirical laws. These empirical laws, the laws of planetary motion, are essentially the kinematics of planetary motion. When it comes to the elliptical orbit of a planet about the Sun, when the planet is closer to the Sun, it moves faster in its orbit, and when it's further away from the Sun, it moves more slowly in its orbit. This then led Kepler, Kepler to ultimately discover the law of equal areas, which is also typically described in the following diagram. Okay, so let's say that right here is an elliptical orbit like so of the planet. I'm greatly exaggerating its eccentricity when I do. Okay, right here is the sun. Okay, recall that the sun is at one focus here on the ellipse. <coughs> and then let's say that we look at the planet, for example, when it is near perihelion, when it's near closest approach. And we do so over some time interval t. And then as Kepler discovered by examining Tycho's data, when the planet is closer to the sun, it's moving faster in its orbit. So in time t, let's say the planet moves from here to here on the diagram. And then as the terminology goes, the planet then sweeps out an area here on the ellipse like so. And then let's say that we take a look at the planet when it's on the other side of the sun. So then therefore it's near aphelion, near its furthest approach from the sun, and is then therefore moving more slowly in its orbit. And then we examine what happens in the same time interval t. And let's say in that time interval that the planet moves from here to here on the ellipse like so. And then once again, as the terminology goes, the planet then sweeps out an area here on the ellipse like so. And then what Kepler discovered is that these areas are equal to each other, equal areas in equal times. Kepler's second law is predictive. That is, you can use Kepler's second law to predict at any time in the future where a planet is going to be in its orbit about the sun. So it's essentially the kinematics of planetary motion. That's essentially as how I describe it to all of my classes, and I really don't say much about it beyond that point. Let's now go through it in more detail here in AP Physics C in the context of angular momentum. Let's go ahead and turn this into a problem. Copy the problem down into your notes. Use conservation of angular momentum to prove Kepler's second law, the law of equal areas. Okay, let me go ahead and do some erasing here. Okay, now of course we know that the sun exerts a gravitational force on a planet as the planet orbits the sun. Does the sun exert a gravitational torque on the planet as the planet orbits the sun? No, for the following reason. So let's say it right here once again is an elliptical orbit like so. Let's say it right here is the sun. And let's say that we examine the planet right over here. Okay, now in terms of its orbital motion, we have a moment arm. That moment arm then goes from the sun to this point like so. Let's refer to this as R. Okay, and then of course we have the gravitational force vector. The gravitational force vector that the sun exerts upon the planet is like so. And then notice that there is a 180 degree angle between those two vectors. Regardless of where the planet is on the ellipse, there's always going to be a 180 degree angle between the moment arm and the gravitational force vector. When calculating the magnitude of the torque, we would then therefore have the sine of 180 degrees, which is equal to zero. So no torque is exerted then upon a planet as it orbits the sun. It's exerted upon the planet as it orbits the sun. Okay, therefore the angular momentum of the planet as it orbits the sun is equal to a constant. So let's get that out of the way first, understanding that the angular momentum of the planet as it orbits the sun has to be a conserved quantity. Okay, then out of that, how do we then end up with a statement of the law of equal areas? Well, what we do is we examine an infinitesimally small area that is swept out by the planet in an infinitesimally small amount of time as it orbits the sun. 
This will, then, this will then result in the following diagram. So let's examine a small piece of what is happening here on this side of the ellipse as the planet orbits the sun. Okay, so to do so, I'm gonna draw this. I'll explain my diagram in just a moment. Let me just complete it here. Okay, what I'm drawing out here is an infinitesimally small triangle with an area dA. This occurs over an extremely small time interval dt. Right here, we'll say, is the location of the sun. Okay, here's our planet of mass m. And at this moment, let's just say that the velocity vector of the planet looks like this. This is the velocity vector v. And then what I'm going to do is take that velocity vector v and break it up into components, as you can see here on the diagram. Basically, first of all, this component here is parallel to this direction, and this component is perpendicular to that direction. Let's go ahead and define an angle here on the diagram theta. Okay, now this distance right here is going to be the component of v, v sine theta, multiplied by the time interval dt. That's this little distance right here. And now let's just go ahead and calculate the area of this triangle. Remember that the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So the area of this triangle is gonna be one half times the base, which is this quantity right here, and then multiplied by the height. Because the triangle is infinitesimally small, the height is the distance r, that is the distance from the sun to the planet. Okay, now let me just go ahead and rearrange some terms here. So I'm gonna move the time dt to the denominator on the other side of the expression, like so. And then I'm gonna have right here an r times v sine theta times one half, like so. Okay, now notice that this right here is starting to look like angular momentum, but what's missing is the mass m of the planet. So let me now go ahead and take the right-hand side of the expression here and just multiply it by one. Let me write it like this. Like so. And then I have here also an m in the denominator. So all that I did was I took this expression here, I multiplied it by one. I multiplied it by m over m. The reason I did that is because right here is the cross product between r and p, the linear momentum vector, mvr sine theta, that's just equal to L equals r cross p, rp sine theta, so then therefore mvr sine theta. So this right here is the angular momentum L, like so. And that's as far as we have to go. And the reason why is because we remember that we already know that the angular momentum is a constant. This is a constant as the planet orbits the sun, therefore the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. That right there is just a simple proof of Kepler's second law. One last thing about this, however, before I conclude this lecture, recall of course that there is a direction associated with the angular momentum vector L. As the planet is orbiting the sun, say in a counterclockwise fashion on this diagram, its angular momentum vector L points out of the board like so. Now, if this is a vector quantity, this then means that over here, somehow, area has to be a vector quantity as well. How is area a vector? We'll see that later on when we eventually get to electricity and magnetism.